especially for the puffling that we've all been privy to watching this season, despite the technical difficulties and down cameras this season. It signals the end of the season, of course, but it also signals the beginning of one, one that we don't get to see, the one out on open ocean. So while we say goodbye for now to the puffins who called Seal Island their summer home, we wish them well on the long migrations ahead of them. The end of seabird breeding season also means that the research season out on Seal Island, one of the seven research islands managed by the Seabird Institute, is coming to an end. And I'm pleased to be joined tonight by two members of Seal Island's research team, Coco Faber and Juliana Ramirez. These two researchers have been stationed on Seal Island since May, studying the seabirds on the island, not least of which is the Atlantic puffin. And I'm sure that we have a lot of puffin cam fans in the audience tonight with lots of questions for both of you. So I hope you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Coco. I'm the Seal Island Supervisor. Um, I've been working for this project for the past eight years, and I spent the last four on Seal. And we're really happy to be talking to you tonight. Hi, I'm Juliana. Um, it's my second year on the project. I'm a research assistant here on Seal this year. Uh, last year, I was supervisor of Outer Green Island. Um, and yeah, thrilled to be here great season. I'm excited to talk about it. Yeah, so last time that we spoke, we had another live event back in May. Um, the season had just started um, and we were sort of welcoming the birds back to the area on Seal Island. So I think it's it's fitting that we that we meet again to close out the season. Um, so let's talk a little bit about tonight's main attraction, the puffins. Um, so what has their season been like this year? Well, oh, this has been kind of an interesting year, actually, for our birds. So we saw low hatch success. So that means the number of eggs that successfully actually hatch into chicks on the island. Um, we saw that was about the lowest hatch success in the past 10 years or so. Um, but we actually expect to see relatively high fledge success. So that means that out of the chicks that actually made it hatching out of their eggs, um, many of them have already or will fledge um, and in good condition too. And so when we have that low hatch success and we have the high fledge success, we have sort of okay productivity, which is basically our way of measuring how well the puffins are doing, how many pairs successfully raised a chick until it left the island. Um, and really just broadly, this is a result of some of the weather patterns that we've had this year. So. We had a few big rainstorms. We found some burrows that were flooded out. And we also think that it's possible that some birds either abandoned their eggs earlier, actually never laid an egg this season because possibly of um, the amount of food or lack of a lot of food that was available right at the beginning of the season when they were starting to incubate their eggs. Um, but then we had this huge wave of the fish that a lot of our camp viewers saw, those noodly fish, those are all sand lands. And we saw some of the fattest puffin chicks that we've ever seen on the island. They're just sucking down sand lands. And um, <laughs> now that we're sort of tapering, we're seeing our puffins bring back a bunch of really small hake and some haddock, which are also things that longer time camp viewers should be pretty familiar with. So, yeah, I know we, we have a lot of camp viewers who who are very adept at um, kind of identifying the fish that come into the burrow. So it's it's really great that we get to have that view um, as well of what the puffins are eating. Um, so it sounds like, yeah, by all by all accounts, it's it's been a great year for, for the puffins feeding. Um, and I know that there have been some years in the past in which fledging has been especially bittersweet for viewers to watch um, because the pufflings were maybe not super equipped for life on the high seas. Um, so it's great that this year we're seeing healthy birds. And I wonder, as researchers, you guys are, are pretty familiar with the birds in a totally different way. So what kinds of things go through your mind or how do you feel when you're observing the birds um, take their, their first steps out of the safety of their nests? Um, so our experience seeing the birds fledge is actually pretty similar to what people on the camp see. Uh, so Basically, you know, we're going around and checking certain burrows every couple of days and, you know, the, slowly see them gain weight and say, oh, like you're getting these nice feathers and, you know, growing strong and we're really rooting for them. Um, but then you keep on checking, keep on checking. And then all of a sudden, um, 
there is no more puffling and it's big enough that we can presume that it glitched. Um, so it's really exciting, but also yes, bittersweet where, you know, we're excited to see them. We're excited to see how they're doing. And then all of a sudden they're gone. Um, <laughs> but sometimes we do get to see them uh, pop their head out of the burrow and, you know, flap their wings a little bit. Um, overall, it is a very magical experience. Um, you know, they go from a little tiny black soot ball to a muscular, powerful bird who can fly and feed themselves in 35 to 45 days, which is just absolutely wild to think about that. And really to like pull them out, see them, they have these beautiful, strong wings, especially the birds this year. You know, they've been, they've been feisty, which is mm -hmm. great to see. <laughs> Yeah, and, and backtracking a little bit. So Duryi, who was our who's our burrow puffling this year, um, in our on camera burrow. Um, yeah, there's a clip of him. He's so cute. <laughs> um, he was <laughs> he was a really hefty puffling by all accounts. So and he was on the higher end of the weight and size spectrum, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was over four hundred grams and that's a mark that like there are some years where we never hit that like we don't find a single chick that weighs that much and i've seen a lot of years that are really tough where a lot of our birds have really really low weights and um when we pulled him out of the burrow uh he just we were all really really excited to see him when we banded him and he just looked gorgeous i mean as as everyone knows but um yeah he's in really really good condition i think everyone can feel really good about him his body condition at Fledge, yeah, it was just right. <laughs> and what was his wing size again? I do not remember off the top of my head, but I think <laughs> I, I, if I make it up a number, I think it was like maybe, it was probably between like 117 and 127. <laughs> um, so those I think are, it was 117. That's a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so that's like a pretty like near fledge measurement, usually like above 115 to like 135. Those are measurements where we, we look, okay, we're not going to do it next time. Mm -hmm. You should be gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's such a special thing to see these puffins grow. Um, and especially Dury, we were all very lucky to see um, to see him cope pretty well with some attacks, and then also, really, um, he was a, he was a big puffling. <laughs> so it's really exciting to see. Um, and fledging, <laughs> it's it's just like this loop of an ending mixed with the beginning, which I find really hopeful and beautiful. Um, and especially too the fact that puffins fledge at night. There's something that feels very um, very special about that. That they're kind of on their own. They do this by themselves, and then that's that's the start of their journey. Um, but yeah, so in the summer issue of Audubon's magazine, um, Project Puffin is given a feature and the piece by Renee Ebersole actually opens fittingly with the fledging of the first puffins who were brought from Newfoundland um, to Eastern Egg Rock here in Maine. So for those who don't know the origin story of Project Puffin, it's an incredibly inspiring story of wildlife restoration and conservation. So Audubon's Seabird Institute grew from Project Puffin, which was the first seabird restoration project of its kind. Project Puffin is actually responsible for bringing puffins back to Maine. Um, and Project Puffin turns 50 this year. So I think it's really important, especially on this anniversary, to talk about the origins of Project Puffin. Um, and while we're privy to plentiful puffin sightings now, thanks to both the live cams and local puffin watching tours, there was a time when seeing a puffin um, in this area in Maine was pretty much impossible. So by the early 1900s, puffins were extirpated from Maine hunted nearly to local extinction for their meat and for their feathers. In 1902, there was only two puffins remaining on Matinicus Rock, another island off the coast of Rockland. The islands, which had once hosted robust puffin colonies, were overtaken by gulls, left unwieldy and windswept with nary a puffin in sight. Um, and Project Puffin's founder, Dr. Steve Kress, came to Maine as an ornithology instructor. At Audubon's oldest educational camp, Hog Island, which is here in Bremen, Maine, um, so while serving as an instructor at this camp, Dr. Kress read an account of the puffins on Seal Island, which once boasted Maine's largest Atlantic puffin colony. At the time when Dr. Kress read this account, um, puffins were pretty much nowhere to be seen in Maine. That these birds were once plentiful in the area was really a revelation for Dr. Kress, who pictured robust puffin colonies 
returning to Maine somehow in some way. Um, so this was the spark that became Project Puffin in 1973, which was 50 years ago this year. Dr. Kress translocated 10-day-old pufflings um, from the populous puffin colony in Newfoundland to eastern Egg Rock, another of the now restored puffin islands. The hope in bringing these chicks and rearing them on the island to fledging age was that they would imprint onto the island and return to breed there. So if you can imagine the immense hope that this project began with, the blind faith and determination to keep the project going. Um, Dr. Kress and a team of helpers, um, like you guys, continued to bring pufflings to Eastern Egg Rock until the first breeding pairs of puffins were recorded on the island in 1981. So this marked the start of puffins returning to Maine, and now there are over a thousand nesting pairs on three of our research islands, Eastern Egg Rock, Matinicus Rock, and of course Seal Island, where you guys are tonight. Um, and you're both, and all of the researchers at this project are such a huge part of what keeps this project going. So um, all of those who live on these islands all summer are a really integral part in all of this. The Seabird Institute is committed to research, restoration, and conservation. So using data from seven of our seabird research islands, um, we're able to listen to what these birds tell us about climate change, forage fish management, and offshore wind development, and other oceanic challenges. Um, so maybe you all can talk about the importance of the project to you and the work that still has yet to be done and isn't done yet. Sure. Um, so we have a saying here on the island in the project, um, the Gulf of Maine is one of the fastest changing and warming ecosystems in the world right now. Uh, so knowing that coming into this uh, landscape, you know, it just feels really crucial that we're here to monitor what's happening. And of course, the project first started as a way to bring the birds back. Um, but now that they're reestablished, uh, you know, we can do various things to help them, like protect them from predators. Um, but one of the most important things we do is monitoring those species and collecting long term data. Um, you know, building upon years of data, we can observe and measure the changes that are happening in the ecosystem shifting in real time. Um, so on an individual basis, we do care a lot about the birds. You know, we'll definitely go and pick up individuals and weigh and measure them and get really invested. Um, but it is really important to take a step back and take a look at the ecosystem as well, because they would not be here without the ecosystem uh, really providing that space. So yeah, it's, uh, it's very multifaceted. And uh, I think that the project as a whole you know, has had a huge impact on the ecosystem and will continue to do so. And uh, I'm happy to be out here and being being part of that. It's wild to think that 50 years ago that this is when it all began. Indeed, yeah. Yeah, Coco, do you have any thoughts maybe about um, why the 50th is such a great occasion to celebrate? Um, and maybe, you know, it's fitting that as, as the season comes to a close, this is definitely a point of, of reflection about, um, about the birds just being here in general. Yeah, it's something that it's really easy to overlook when we're just, we're going about our work here day to day, you know, we're thinking about blind sense that we have to do and maybe having chicks that we need to grab. And, um, you know, there's a lot of just the daily stuff that, you have, you don't always think about how how much has changed in the past fifty years and and where we are and um, it is really wild for us to think about where the project started and, and every single day when we go out to the puffin colony and the turn colony we actually walk by this little um, area that is now very eroded but it is where the original sod burrows were that um, Steve and other people hand dug out. Um, to put the translocated puffin chicks in so they could feed them until they fledged. Um, and so the the history of this island and of the project, like it's very much part of our daily lives. These, these places, even just these objects that are around us, um, they have that history built into them. And we have um, all of the journals. We have a, a journal from every year, every season, in our cabin and we like to flip back through them and we can learn stuff from them, but it's also just a window into um, what was going on with the birds and the people. 
And, you know, there are entries from the 1980s saying, you know, I was sitting out there for like six hours in the fog and I saw one <laughs> puffin fly by. And, um, you know, we go out there at the peak of the season and we might see over a thousand puffins. And so um, having those little moments of reflection um, is really meaningful for all of us. But I think for me, I'm thinking about the 50th also, like this project really started as this sort of just act of, of hope and really stubborn hope. And I think that that is something I think about in in these difficult times, <laughs> um, times when it can feel really challenging for a lot of the birds, it can feel really challenging for a lot of the people. And I think um, it's easy to feel a lot of fear for them and for ourselves. And so to think about that sort of, that legacy, that sense that's built into this project from the very beginning is of this hope and this um, like desire to seek creative solutions to problems and not just back down. And so that that's something that I've been thinking about a lot um, this season. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really important thing to reflect upon. And I think maybe why puffins themselves are so charismatic to, to viewers and researchers alike, they're, they're survivors, they're very hardy and tough birds. Um, one of my favorite puffin facts is that they can kind of just easily float atop those like huge ocean swells that are, you know, upwards of 100 feet tall. And I always kind of have this picture in my mind of like that little puffin just sitting atop a wave, kind of like cresting it. Um, but yeah, so I mean, community <laughs> engagement is is a, <laughs> is a huge part of, of this project. Um, so as much as this is a celebration of Project Puffin's success and the success of the puffins who've called the island home for the last few months, um, I think this also is a celebration of the community that watches the puffins during their summers here in Maine. Um, so I want to get to some audience questions that we received in advance from our Explore.org viewers. So these questions are super inf insightful and will probably lead um, the rest of our discussion this evening. Um, following that, we'll have um, open questions for people in the Q&A, so please drop your questions um, there as well. So the first question that we have from the advanced questions um, is one that was asked several times actually in both the explore.org Puffin chat um, as well as the Google form that is on the Puffin Cam website. Um, but so do returning Puffins attempt to visit their former burrows and would they be recognized by their parents? So oh, this is a really, really compelling question. These are the kinds of things that like when I'm sitting in a blind, I think about. It's really interesting, um, especially in this like seabird colony, there's all these relationships between them. And like, I so desperately want to know like what is happening in their little minds. Um, <laughs> but the real answer to this question is like, we don't know. Um, so we have this unique view into this one burrow on the island with our burrow camera. Um, and we see these interactions. We see um, stranger birds coming into the burrow and stuff. That was actually a behavior that like we hadn't really observed before the cameras in the burrow. And so we haven't seen any chicks come back to burrow 59 so far. Um, and this would be a really interesting thing to know, but it would also take a lot of pieces um, for us to know this because it would have to be chicks that were banded. We would have to observe them going down into a burrow in a location where we could tell where that which burrow exactly they went into. And then we would have to know that they had hatched out of that burrow. And so all of those pieces of information are something that's like fairly difficult to get when we're out in the field, um, but it would be really interesting to know. Um, and a lot of our younger birds that we see, like returning to the island, they do, they do poke around a lot. So a lot of the stuff of what they do is they socialize with each other. They might be billing with each other. Um, and they also, they'll watch other adults come in who have fish who are feeding their chicks and they'll watch them go into a burrow and then they'll all, all the young ones will crowd around and be like, oh my God, what's he doing? Um, <laughs> that's what I imagine. <laughs> But so they spend a lot of time looking around under the rocks, basically. Um, they may stick their head into their former burrow. I think it's really interesting to think about, you know, obviously they can recognize individual rocks. They always come back to their burrow once they start breeding. So it seems reasonable to imagine that they could recognize the burrow that they fledged out of. 
Um, but I have to say, my guess is that if they did put their stick their heads into their parents' burrow and their parents had a new chick, their parents might treat them as an intruder um, because in that situation they would be. And when those younger puffins are going around looking into burrows, they're looking for an empty burrow typically to nest in with their new mate. Um, so they might be less interested. Um, but again, like this is something that um, I think is just so fascinating and kind of speaks to the limits of our knowledge um, with our, our human brains and sensory perception and everything. Um, and it is just always so interesting to think about what's going on in their minds, how they're sensing and interacting with the world and with each other, um, and how we might get a little bit closer to understanding those things. Mm. I think that one, that one bit that you mentioned about how puffins return to the same burrow year after year is especially important to highlight. Um, that's, that's just an incredible feat of, of recognition and also of direction. Um, and I think it's it's really nice to think about these reunions, um, especially to accompany or maybe mitigate the bittersweet feelings at the end of the season. I know that we tend to imbue human qualities onto the animals that we grow attached to, um, and it's especially easy with the puffins who are very cute. Um, so while we're feeling sort of sentimental, I'll toss out a couple of questions from a user um, at Puff Love. So when a puffin pair bill, they are bonding but aren't they also identifying each other when they return to their nesting grounds in future years? If this is true for adult puffins, is it not also true for the pair and their chick? Um, 2023's Seal Island Burrow Chick Dury appeared to be billing with his parents, Willie and Millie, on several occasions. Because this occurred when Dury was a chick, are they able to identify each other in future years when Dury returns to Seal Island? So I know this is kind of a similar question to the one we just answered. Um, but I wonder if we can talk about this a little bit. Yeah, so these are definitely linked questions. Um, I think there is maybe a little bit of confusion within this question about that billing behavior. So when the puffins are billing, what you're seeing is a, is a bonding behavior, um, but that happens because they know who each other are. So I don't think that that specific billing behavior is like the way that they recognize each other. Um, but this actually kind of goes back to what I was saying before. So it's like really interesting to think about how they recognize each other and like what they look like to each other, um, especially because um, we can definitely see some individual variation. We can often distinguish um, generally younger birds um, with like smaller bills and fewer or less deep bill ridges from older birds that have heftier bills. Um, but in general, like when we look at a group of puffins, they look very similar to us, um, just as, as a group. But we don't know what they look like to each other. So I don't think that um, that they would be more able to recognize each other specifically because they had done that behavior with each other. But I do think that um, there is, you know, we can see just just anecdotally, experientially, we can see that um, puffins are interacting with each other as individuals. They appear to recognize each other. And I don't think there is a reason to think that they wouldn't necessarily have some level of recognition um, for each other. Unfortunately, it's the sort of thing we can't prove. Yes. We, <laughs> if only we had puffin goggles, we could experience what it's truly like for them. But yeah. Yes, we can only wonder. <laughs> yeah. So just just to get this clear for for myself, um, so when when we see maybe like Dury, for instance, kind of rubbing rubbing bills with with a parent, um, that's not so much like re-identification behavior, but more um, more of just burrow behavior. Yeah, I mean, I think it is like it is this behavior of. So a lot of birds do these behaviors that are um, these bonding behaviors. And so um, they're helping like solidify their relationships with each other, um, just like how we humans have things that we do um, to sort of cement our bonds. But I don't think that that behavior specifically is in is like letting them know who each other is, if that makes sense. Mm hmm. 
totally. Yeah. And actually, the behavior in that video clip that you just played, that actually looks to me like Durya is um, begging for food from his parent. Mm. Um, also be billing, but to me, that looks like a, a, a feed me, feed me, feed me um, <laughs> behavior. <laughs> He does, he does look very earnest in that clip, <laughs> for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but so on the note of identification, I've also seen quite a few questions about identifying individual birds. Um, so maybe let's talk a little bit how the birds are identified. Um, first, maybe talk about the bands that you all use that you put on the birds. Um, so yes, every bird that we're monitoring, as long as we're able to get our hands on them, uh, we ban them. So we'll do a bird banding lab band, a uh, BBL is what we call it for short, and then a field readable band. Um, now the field readables aren't quite as field readable as you might expect. <laughs> um, you, you can read them with binoculars, you know, up to a certain distance, but we really do use scopes to, um, you know, do a recite of those birds. Um, but basically, you know, the only tool we really use is um, banding pliers to put the bands on the birds. Um, but we are keeping track uh, very studiously <laughs> of, you know, what birds have what band, what burrow they came from, what age they were when we banded them. Um, and all of that information is going into a database that we use um, called Seabird Finder. And so all of the birds, not just puffins, um, in the Gulf of Maine are, uh, that are banded, <laughs> are, are um, in the software. So, you know, we can go out, we can do a stint uh, resetting birds, get a couple bands, come back to the cabin, look it up in the database. You know, what year is that bird from? Who banded it? What is its name? It has a name, um, which is always very fun. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, it is difficult to, see these bands because they are so detailed um on like the cam for example but yeah also with binoculars um we definitely have our moments where we're like oh there's a banded bird right in front of me but i just don't have what i need <laughs> um occasionally we do use uh plastic field readables which are colored um colored bands that are plastic like the name would suggest um, and those are definitely more readable with the binoculars, um, but that's definitely on like a case by case basis, specific research projects, things like that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it can be really difficult to ID a bird from a distance, for sure. Those bands are incredibly tiny. I wish I had one I could like show people. Um, but I wonder, so a lot of viewers, <laughs> a lot of viewers, um, you know, are sort of curious about the birds that they see on the cams that are banded. Um, and I, I wonder if you guys can talk about why it might be really difficult to kind of glean the identity of a bird just through the camera footage. Um, is it kind of similar to to it just being difficult to read or, or maybe talk a little bit about that? I, I know some, some viewers have actually been able to like screenshot from like the loafing ledge cam and like we have actually gotten <laughs> some recites from that, which is, Pretty crazy. Um, thank you, because I'm <laughs> I'm very impressed. Whenever I look at the video, it's really hard for me to tell. Yeah. But basically, like you would need to see all of the characters on the band. So if it's turned a little bit and you can't see all of them in one frame, um, then you can't read the band. And a lot of times, people take screenshots where if it's not really fully in focus on that band, like what what all of you see as viewers is what we see too. Like often it's like sort of smushy gray shapes and we just can't read it from that. Um, but occasionally people can, I think probably if they're like the exact right distance from the camera and it's fo really focused on them. But yeah, you need, mm. you need the perfect conditions to come together. Yes. <laughs> yeah. This is, this and is especially, so true. <laughs> <laughs> especially, uh, cells, you know, basically, the band like field readables there's four uh like letters or numbers that we're trying to see and they are repeated around the band but if a bird only has a bbl you have to get the full i think it's um, nine nine nine, yeah, numbers. nine numbers <laughs> and because we put the bands on these birds in sequential or numeric order um even if one number is off 
you could just not have the band. And we've definitely been out there and said, oh, I got I got everything but the last number. But then it's like, yep, that last number made a difference. It could have been 10 different words because <laughs> of that one number. But yeah, the scopes that we use mm -hmm. definitely, you know, they will get that really, really fine focus. I mean, it actually is really wild how much detail we can see with them. So we're very lucky to have those tools yeah. out here. Absolutely. Um, and I know that everyone who watches the puffins really hopes that every year they'll see a puffin that they knew or that maybe they saw hatch in prior years um, return. So it really speaks to the connections that are made through these live cams, um, which can be a huge asset for projects like ours, which prioritizes conservation. So having people make these connections with the birds is really important for garnering the kind of attention that it takes to keep their population robust. Um, so other ways that folks might be able to get connected with the seabirds here in Maine is to check out our website for more information about um, ways that you can kind of get involved and know more. Um, so the Seabird Institute hires a host of researchers every summer to stay on the islands. So if that's something that compels you, um, definitely check the website to find out more information. Um, you can also find links to ways that you can give to Project Puffin. So I think a lot of folks watching tonight might be interested in our Adopt a Puffin program. Um, so for a small fee, you can symbolically adopt a puffin that resides on one of our research islands. Um, and when you adopt this puffin, you'll receive a certificate of adoption, as well as updates about what your puffin has been up to. Um, and this can be a really great way to get your puffin fix once the season is over. Um, so our next question comes from user at I Love Birds. Um, the egg was earlier this year, the egg being um, the puffin egg in the burrow, um, compared to most other years. So the season ends a bit early this time. I was wondering if the island staff kept track of the other burrows around that time. Would you be able to check about other egg late dates approximately and let us know? Yeah, so um, a lot of what we do actually is monitoring this kind of thing. So we try and get an idea of the overall breeding success of our puffins for season, and also of a lot of our other species that are breeding on the island and so we call this productivity so what that means is we're trying to measure how many chicks fledged per pair of adults and we also monitor how well the chicks grow so we have about 65 burrows that we check regularly, which includes burrow 59, although we get to just look at the camera feed. We don't have to peer in there. Um, <laughs> we always know what's happening. Um, and then we record um, the first time we see an egg in there. We record when we see a chick hatching out or hatched out. And we record when they fledge. And we also have a smaller number of burrows that are fairly easy for us to grab the chick out of so that we don't stress them out too much, but we're able to get some data and we measure how long their wing is and how heavy they are. And we do those checks um, pretty regularly throughout the seasons. So we get this sense of how well they're doing, how well they're growing. So we have a pretty good idea actually of the spread of lay dates this year. Um, generally, the Camboro historically has been sort of in the middle of the, the span of lay dates. Um, this year, they were one of the earlier ones. Um, and they that chick was actually the first chick that we knew about on the island that hatched. Um, and that's that this is the first year that um, the cam chick has been the first one that we have found hatched. Um, so we did see overall really early lay dates this year. So typically we get here in early May, like first week of May. And um, within a few days of getting on the island, we do our first check of puffin burrows. We look in them with flashlights, see what's in there. And I usually expect to see one, two eggs in burrows. Most of the time you expect to look and be like, yep, that's empty. Oh, maybe they put a little nesting material in there. Um, but this year when we did our first check, we found about 25 burrows that actually already had um, eggs or adults incubating in, in them. So for in my experience, that's fairly unprecedented, having that many burrows active that early. And so really generally, they were about two weeks earlier um, than they have been in the past few years. Um, and so that's been really interesting to see. It's been really interesting to watch that play out through the season. 
And it also has allowed the birds to take advantage of this peak of food that is available. So something that we typically see throughout a season is that birds that lay their eggs early, the chicks hatch early, and they usually hit a good window for forage fish that's available and they fledge at good weights. And then towards the end of the season, there's often less fish out there as the sea surface temperatures rise. And we see birds that might struggle a little bit more um, at fledging. And so seeing a lot of our birds early this year um, has been really interesting. Also um, kind of heartening. You know, we've seen these really hefty, chunky fledglings that we'd love to see. Um, and so it, I think it'll be really interesting in the next few years to see if this is a trend that continues. Mm -hmm. um, you're sort of like, okay, what do they know that we don't know, maybe? Um, and it's interesting to see a lot of birds make that decision. Too. It definitely mm -hmm. wasn't like a one-off. It's kind of a collective thing that had happened. And yeah, uh, it was yeah. definitely a collection of things that that went well for them, which was yeah. great to see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I was out there with you guys on sale, which was seems like forever ago, I mean, we were we were finding lots of puffin eggs um, in in the prod that I was part of, um, and it was it was so great to be kind of like hunched over on these on these rocks and just shining a little flashlight into a burrow to to see an egg or even a live puffin maybe sitting on an egg. Um, and speaking of looking in burrows, we have a question from at Elm One. Is there a chance that we could get a burrow cam for the razos, which are razor bills, um, another seabird that is living on Seal Island? Um, I wish we could have <laughs> a razor bill uh, burrow. It's phenomenal. Um, it doesn't seem like the most feasible thing right now, but for a few different reasons. But it's something that I, I believe we're going to get more into later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so there was a lot of talk about the razor bill camera, um, you know, the potential for it being installed, especially after the drama in the Guillemot borough this season. Um, so essentially what happened on that camera, just to give a recap, um, is that we saw one Guillemot egg once the, once the camera was live, which was early in the season as well. Um, and then a few days later, we saw another two eggs in the borough, uh, which is unprecedented seeing as guillemots do not lay three eggs. Um, so likely what happened was that one bird laid an egg and then maybe abandoned the burrow um, or else was forced out by the new pair who steadfastly tried to incubate all three eggs. Um, and then to kind of top it all off, there was a pair of interloping puffins who engaged in a kind of like turf war with the guillemots um, over the burrow <laughs> after all of this. <laughs> um, so we had some folks who were saying that instead of having a cam in the guillemot burrow, we might just move it to a razor bill burrow. Um, and I have to say though, I'm kind of excited to see how the guillemot burrow cam plays out next year. Um, will we have guillemots or puffins? So there's kind of suspense there. Um, but Coco, I know that you are really involved in installing the cameras. So maybe you have some thoughts on a razor burrow cam. Yeah, I mean, like Juliana said, I think we would love to see inside of a razor bill burrow, but there are a bunch of reasons why it would be fairly difficult. So um, one thing is just like, we are really bound by the physical realities of the island. Um, and so we have a central spot that we call the hub where the solar panels and the batteries and all like the control panels are that run all the cameras. It's very fancy and technical. Um, and then, cables go out from that that actually connect to the cameras that we put in the burrows. And so the burrows have to be fairly close to the hub. So we don't have razor bill burrows that are in a very convenient location. So most of our razor bill burrows are actually way, way far down the island, a totally different area. And we do have some burrows that are closer, that are um, closer in, mix in with most of the puffing burrows. Um, but they are still in a kind of an inconvenient location. Um, and then the other thing is that for a burrow to work with the camera, it has to like hit this trifecta basically. Um, so it has to be close enough to the hub. It also has to have an area where we could put the camera where it's not going to intrude on the burrow. And it also isn't going to block like an entrance or exit from the burrow for the birds. And then it has to have like a good space where the whole the whole space of the burrow is visible for the camera. 
And it's just really hard to find burrows that meet all those specifications. We have also found that our razor bills are a little bit more sensitive than the puffins sometimes. And especially the ones that are nearby or nearer to the cameras that are already out um, are still still establishing themselves really in that area. And so they're a little bit more likely to abandon, especially if something crazy happens, like suddenly there's just a big object in their burrow. Um, and then the final thing is that razor bills have a really different breeding strategy than the other alcids on the island. So they raise their chicks in the burrow for somewhere between just two to three weeks. Their chicks will be fully feathered, but very small still. And then they get led out to sea by their parents and their fathers actually continue to feed them on the ocean, which is a really amazing, incredible breeding strategy, but also does not lend itself well to full season of ham watching. So, but we would let, the chicks mm. are very cute. We would love to see them on the games. Yes, <laughs> we'd love for people to see them as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's, you know, that like turf war kind of thing that you were describing, that does happen between puffins and razor bulls. So even the razor bull burrows that we have marked, it's like, oh, there might be a puffin there. We just don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. that being said, we are, I, I think we're pretty lucky to have a guillemot burrow because the large, large majority of guillemot burrows are actually everywhere else on the island. Um, mm -hmm. And they do, they do, uh, we, we luck out because they do kind of just go in narrow cracks that are really nice for cam viewing, but it'll be interesting next yeah. year. We look forward to seeing what happens. Yes. Because if not, well, I know. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited for next year's Guillemot Burrow. It's going to be, it's going to be a real surprise. Lots of suspense. Um, but so yeah, mm -hmm. our next question, and then we'll move on to live questions shortly after that. Um, so the next question in advance comes from at Ichabod, who is a very astute observer, uh, but they ask, some of the puffins have very orange feet and other puffins' feet are more yellow. Why is this? Uh, so this is something that we actually have wondered amongst ourselves because some, yes, yeah, sometimes it'll be really pale yellow. Sometimes it'll be bright, bright orange. Um, I did do some looking into this and it seems like the yellowish, duller color um, that's generally what puffins' feet look like in the winter. Um, and as, you know, they come into the breeding season, their bills get brighter and so do their feet. Um, however, there is variation within individuals. So we don't totally know why some are brighter than the other. It's kind of similar to the question of what's going on inside their head. You know, why do these things happen? Mm -hmm. um, there isn't a concrete answer, but it is probably connected to the maybe the quality of their like plumage and these characteristics that they have to attract mates um because that super bright bill that's something that really is like seen as attractive to show oh this bird is getting enough resources could be a potential mate um so along that same route maybe if they have paler feet they're not getting as much fish just a guess don't really know, <laughs> but there could be yeah. some connection there. Yeah, that's that's an awesome guess. I feel like that makes sense in my mind. Um, but yeah, so our last question in advance, um, real quick. Um, does Audubon have any pre-made material that can be sent to senators and delegates? Um, I'd like to contact my representatives and thought having information to provide them, printed or a link, would help them understand ways in which they can go to bat in DC. So this is a really great question, um, especially as we are rounding the 50th year of this project. Um, there is still a lot of work to be done going forward as far as um, keeping our oceans and keeping land clean. Um, so there are several ways that you can participate in the conservation of seabirds and coastal habitats alike. Our website, um, seabirdinstitute.audubon.org, has a page devoted to advocacy, which includes links to Audubon's toolkit for coastal stewardship, gulf restoration, and ways that you can participate in marine conservation. Um, and I also want to flag the Forage Fish Act, which was a bill that was introduced to Congress in 2021. So this act would mitigate the overfishing of small forage fish that are integral to seabirds' diets. Um, and we do have forms at our in-person visitor center in Rockland, Maine, the Project Puffin Visitor Center, um, in which you can put your signature down in print and we will send those off. Um, 
but as some of you may know, the Audubon Society was actually started in response to the alarming decline in certain bird populations um, as a result of especially the millinery trade, which directly contributed also to puffins decline. Um, so the Migratory Bird Treaty, which was codified in 1918, has since protected several species, including puffins, from hunting. And this is all a result of a very tangible and very um, effective legislature and just essentially advocacy. Um, so I highly recommend that y'all get involved in that way as much as you can. Um, but so let's open things up to the chat now. We've got some questions coming in. Um, the first one is, we kind of already touched on this, but can you talk a little bit about the gillies, which are the guillemots? So sad we didn't have any hatches on cam, but how did they do in general this year? Hmm. Um, well, looking at the productivity of the guillemots, because that's something else that we collect data on. Um, unfortunately, the guillemots didn't do quite as well as the puffins did this year. Um, they do have a different diet from the puffins. So that actually kind of lines up. Um, yeah, yeah, we have a, a certain amount of burrows that we monitor actually right above camp, essentially, because um, that's where there's a big cluster of them. Um, yeah, yeah, they didn't do quite as well, but there were still some in, good in healthy some ways, fledglings. fairly similar where we had some nest fail early on, mm -hmm. um, but most of our chicks that have made it to fledging, and some of them have already left their burrows, um, we do still have some, quite a few on the island, um, but those ones that did make it to fledge were in pretty good condition. Yes, don't get me wrong. The, yeah. <laughs> the fledglings that did well were very feisty, as they yes. always are. So the yeah. ones that did well did do well, essentially. And uh, they're due to fledge pretty soon. Yeah, yeah. Good to know. Yeah, I mean, it was really unfortunate, just the, the drama in the, the Gilmot Camboro. Mm -hmm. But yes, good to know that um, things are OK on the whole. So next question, um, did you experience any of the smoke from the Canadian wildfires or see a change in puffin behaviors from the smoky conditions? I actually think that we did not really get too much of that, at least like the, you know, we've been like reading articles and talking to um, friends and family on the mainland. Mm -hmm. and. Um, from that, I don't, you know, we did have sort of weird weather this season and we've had a lot, a lot of wet conditions and um, a lot of fog, a lot of very foggy days, a lot of rainy days this season, but um, we never had like really obvious smoky haze or the smell of smoke um, mm. in the air. And so I think really, um, once again, our island protects us from the real world <laughs> yes, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. We're keeping our eye on the yeah. horizon and kind of asking, like, oh, is this is this a weird cloud um, when we could see the horizon because there was just so much fog. Yes. <laughs> Who could see the smoke for all the fog? Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, it seems like the fog has, has abated this evening. It looks very clear and very beautiful out there tonight. Yes, yeah. you can see the sun. It's the land, the mainland <laughs> is real. Yes. <laughs> I mean, how, how long, this is a kind of question just that I'm curious about, but how long was it, was it foggy for? I mean, it seems like it was an incredibly rainy and cold um, spring and early summer here in Maine. So for us on the island, I mean, there were little moments where there were breaks in the fog, but um, I would say a solid month. Um, so late yeah. June to July-ish. Um, pretty much every single day was at least partially foggy. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's, I haven't had that experience of quite that much fog before personally. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That must've been, that must've been really tough. Yeah. Um, I think that what's kind of notable about the fog is that it kept, uh, we think it kept sea surface conditions actually fairly low. Mm -hmm. So yeah. in a weird way, the, fog that was kind of mind-boggling to us was actually pretty beneficial to the fish. Yeah. I mean, to the, the fish and the birds. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I know that's one of the things, so um, on the puffin cruises that people people can take to go circle eastern egg rock, um, I know that the overcast days are especially good for puffin sightings, um, so maybe there definitely is a point to that, to that being um, beneficial. Um, but next question, so do puffin pairs like Willie and Millie 
remain together after breeding season or do they migrate in different directions? So this is a question that, again, we don't quite know the answer to exactly. Um, what we do know is that when puffins leave the island for the winter, they generally go off to sort of out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And so they're they're bobbing around out there, maybe cresting those 100 foot waves. <laughs> um, and it is definitely possible that those individuals are, you know, near each other, but they are not traveling together. So when they leave the island, um, they're, they're not necessarily like leaving the island buddied up with each other. Um, and when they come back, you know, they return to that burrow and they, they find each other there on the island. Um, so it would be really interesting to know, um, exactly where they go in relation to each other, but that, you know, it's only in the past 10 years that we even know where they go in the winter at all. Mm hmm yeah, and I mean, again, that's another reason to to support our project and other, and other seabird projects as well, is that we get this really invaluable data um, that's also just really fun to know and fun to look at. Um, but so next question, um, is there a chance in a few years that we will see Dirty back on the island? I know this is it. This is a sentimental question that I also am like, I have a hopeful <laughs> answer in my heart. I wonder what you guys think. I would say, of course, there's a chance. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I think one of the most magical things for us, um, especially like for me, one of the reasons I have to keep coming back here is that um, if you stick around long enough, you get to see birds that you banded and you get to, you know, you might have a memory of holding them. You have a memory of what their burrow looked like. And then you see that bird return as an adult. And it is just, it's magic, that moment. Um, and he really fledged in a good body condition. I think he, I think he has all the chances in the world that could be given to him, you know, as, as a little puffling. Um, of course, we don't know what will happen to him. And there, it's easy to be fearful about that. But I think that he has, he, he left the island well prepared. Um, to come back eventually. So we certainly hope we will see him in the future. Yeah. And I, I, think I mean, I was, I, yeah, I was very impressed with, with his sheer feistiness, especially when sort of stranger puffins would come into the burrow, which we saw a lot this year. Um, as he got older, he got more adept at fighting them off. And I was, I was like, wow, those little puffins got hands kind of. <laughs> um, <laughs> But next question. So we only have a couple minutes left, so we'll get to these last few. Um, are all the puffins original to the island, Seal Island, or did it have some transported from other areas? Um, we haven't had any transported essentially since the beginning of the project, um, but not quite all of the puffins are from this island in the same way that not all puffins at this island um, my words mixed up. <laughs> um, we have puffins that did not originate from here as well. So this is something we can learn through the banding process where they're banded as chicks on a certain island. That island is linked to their like profile on um, in the database. And then years later, when it's recited, you know, you can say, oh, this bird actually came from Matt Rock or or mm -hmm. someone else could say, oh, this bird came from Seal. Yeah. Uh, so Willie, for example, is actually banded on Matinicus Rock. And so we do see that puffins, when they're young, they do spend time when they're first coming back to any of these islands. We often see them on multiple islands. So they will fly around to different places and kind of decide where to stay. Mm -hmm. So we have there are puffins from Seal that go breed elsewhere, and there are puffins from Eastern Egg Rock and Matinicus Rock that come breed here. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, um, I mean, just to reiterate as well, the trans transportation, I wonder, maybe that got a little bit confused. So that is how the project started, is that puffins, pufflings were translocated from a larger puffin colony to these islands um, where there were no puffins. Um, and then those pufflings did imprint onto the island. And that's kind of how we have um, the puffins here in Maine today. So last question before we close out. Um, will the puffins, and this is a great question to end on, will the pufflings meet up with the other puffins during migration or do they remain solitary at sea 
Also, a huge thank you, researchers and Project Puffin. Thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah, so this is kind of the, the pair question. Um, so they do all go to the same general area, as far as we know. Um, but I think they travel there probably mostly on, on their own terms. Um, so they are, I'm sure, near other puffins. Um, it's not, it's something that we have a very small window into. And again, like a thing that would be really interesting as especially our like GPS tagging technology develops. I think a lot of these kinds of questions are ones that we'll hopefully be getting closer and closer to answering as that technology develops and as our strategies for using it develop. Um, so because this is something that I think we all think about, you know, they leave our island. How can you not wonder where they go and and what their experience is and with their whether they're with each other or not? The majority of their life is out at sea. And we see them in these moments where we think, oh, like this is where puffins are. Like, no, puffins are really just living their lives out in the ocean for years without being seen by a human after perhaps hatching out of their egg. <laughs> mm. My internet did cut out for a little bit of that, the worst timing. But um, yes, from what from what I <laughs> from what I understand, um, I think there is something really poetic about the fact that yeah, these seabirds really are on the ocean for most of their lives, um, and this this time period where they're on the island is just a short slice and a, like a little glimpse, um, and a really special one nonetheless. But it is a reminder um, to all of us that these birds. Um, you know, they call the oceans home and it's really important to keep them protected and keep them safe. Um, but yes, so visit our website, um, seabirdinstitute.audemont.org to learn more about ways to get involved. Um, and as always, thank you for watching the cams and thank you for watching this evening. Um, I'm here to answer any questions in the chat um, in the Puffin cams on explore.org. And let's thank Coco and Juliana for joining us as well. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for hosting. <laughs> yeah, questions. Thanks for joining everyone. Yeah. Absolutely. Have a great night, everyone.